In a speech presented at the Vice Chancellor's inaugural lecture on 14 September, the University of Cape Town's Professor Pierre de Force delivered a lecture titled The Past is Unpredictable Race, Redress, and Remembrance in the South African Constitution. Professor DeFoe started his lecture with comments about the way UCT has been criticized by some commentators for its use of race as a proxy for admission. Much ink has been spilled about the criteria of UCT to make decisions about admissions policies uh, at the university. Several UCT ac uh, academics, political leaders, opinion makers and members of the public have objected to this policy saying that it's racist or that it's reverse discrimination. In one instance a commentator, perhaps having been overcome by uh, a momentary amnesia about South Africa's past and being maybe a little bit uh, carried away by his own indignation, said that UCT was becoming like Nazi Germany. Opposition to UCT's admissions policy is of course based on the fact that it divides South African applicants into categories. Those on the one hand judged to have been affected by inequality and disadvantage, the redress category, and those who have not, the open category. And the policy further then divides those people in the redress category in terms of, uh, and I always put inverted commas around these terms, black, Indian, colored, and Chinese, and set different uh, criteria for their entrance. Opponents of the policy often invoke the founding values of the South African Constitution, which are, of course, many of you would know, human dignity, the achievement of equality, the advancement of human rights and freedom, as well as non-racialism and non-sexism. And they argue that it is constitutionally impermissible to rely on race as a criteria for admitting students to university or for any other form of redress, really. In order to get beyond race, they say, uh, one has to stop classifying people in racial terms and have to stop using apartheid-era racial classifications to make such decisions. Um, perhaps channeling the present US uh, Chief Justice, I'm not going to say anything else about Chief Justices tonight. <laughs> uh, the US Chief Justice John Roberts uh, who was quoted in one affirmative action case as saying, the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discrimination on the basis of race. In this lecture, I contend that the fact that has been ignored by many who take part in these debates uh, about UCT's admissions policies or about redress measures in general uh, is that Race continues to permeate every aspect of both public and private life in our society. De Force argued that the Constitution prohibits unfair discrimination on the basis of a range of criteria, race included. On the other hand, it does not prohibit the use of race when addressing the effects of past unfair discrimination or when addressing the lingering effects of racial discrimination and racism, he pointed out. Our constitution differs from other constitutions which assume that all are equal and in so doing simply entrench existing inequalities. Our constitution recognizes that decades of systematic racial discrimination entrenched by the apartheid legal order cannot be eliminated without positive action being taken to achieve that result. And that is why the constitutional court has embraced the notion of substantive equality and they have said when we deal with equality, we cannot assume that we have all been born free and equal, and therefore that the Constitution enjoins us to be the, the state and everybody else to treat every single person exactly in the same way. Um, the, the court said this is so because if we do that, if we assume that and if we treat everybody and de demand that everybody is treated exactly the same way, it would freeze the status quo and would not take account of the existing largely racially determined social and economic imbalances and differences of power in our society. Instead, the Constitutional Court has emphasized that there must be a substantive notion of equality that must underlie the Constitutional project. Um, and that substantive equality means that we have to look not at 
uh, how people are treated, but we have to look at the outcome, at the impact of certain treatment, whether the impact is uh, going to address the effects of past discrimination, racial discrimination and other, or whether it is not going to do so. And therefore, the court said these measures, corrective measures, are not reverse racism uh, or positive discrimination, which is the language that they use in the US. Instead, these corrective or institutionary measures, measures are in integral to the reach of our equality protection. Now, the fact that the Constitutional Court has embraced the substantive notion of equality and has emphasized that corrective measures are both co constitutionally permissible and sometimes actually required by the Constitution in order to achieve real equality does not mean that the Constitution places no limits on what corrective measures can be taken. There are three requirements <laughs> that must be met before a measure is constitutionally compliant if it is going to be, say, a race-based corrective measures. The first requirement is that the pro, the, the, one must ask whether the program or whatever uh, of redress is designed to protect and advance uh, a group of people or category of people who have been discriminated unfairly in the past. Um, and that means, therefore, that the court has said that any group that can show that as a group it has been discriminated against in the past, that uh, group will uh, pass the first hurdle of the uh, affirmative action uh, inquiry. And of course, because we uh, must remember our apartheid past, one such group will be black South Africans, whether they are classified in inverted commas as Indians, coloreds, uh, Africans, or whatever the case might be, might be. And the court also said, well, it will not always be easy to, to uh, make these categories watertight. Sometimes um, not all the people who are going to benefit from a scheme will actually have personally suffered discrimination, disadvantage and harm. As long as one can show that the overwhelming majority of the people who are benefiting from the scheme are, belong to a group that have in the past dis been discriminated against unfairly, that first requirement would be met. So that's quite important because that means um, that uh, the, uh, the kind of arguments that are often made uh, that uh, some people are benefiting from corrective measures despite the fact that their father um, might be uh, the beneficiary of tenders or whatever, that that is not necessarily going to convince the constitutional court. Uh, so Tokyo said Kuala's children are going to be safe. <laughs> The second issue is, of course, that it also means that it doesn't necessarily mean that you always have to use race as a criteria for re redress measures, and I'm conceding this. Sometimes you can use something else, and that is what happened in that Van Yerden case, because the Constitutional Court there made, uh, had to decide whether the policy, which said that for five years Parliament would pay a higher pension benefit. People always run to court for pension benefits, but in any case, if you're going to, they, it said if you only joined Parliament in 1994, you got a higher pension benefit. If you already were a member of Parliament before 1994, you had a lower pension benefit. And uh, there was no mention of race. Um, and it was done, I think, on purpose to try and avoid issues of who's black, who's white. And of course, we know many people joined Parliament in 1994 who were white. Ronnie Casserles, Joe Slova, and so forth. So, um, that is important to take into account. The third requirement is really the one that does the work and the one that's also the most difficult. Um, and because it would require really a value judgment, which would have to be made in the light of the circumstances, including the conception of our apartheid past. According to the Constitutional Court, remedial measures can only be constitutionally valid if, thirdly, such measures promotes the achievement of equality in the long term. This is a rather difficult concept, so I'm going to read, uh, if you bear with me, a, a short section of that judgment of Justice Moseneke, in which he explains what is meant by this. 
Determining whether a measure will be, in the long run, promote the achievement of equality requires an appreciation of the effects of the measure in the context of our broader society. It must be accepted that the achievement of the goal may often come at a price for those who were previously advantaged, people like myself. However, it is also clear that the long-term goal of a society is an, in a non-racial, non-sexist society in which each person will be recognized and treated as a human being of equal worth and dignity is important. Central to this vision is the recognition that ours is a diverse society comprised of people of different races, different language groups, different religions, and both sexes. I think they, the court didn't realize that they are also intersex people uh, so they said both sexes, they should have said more than two sexes, but in any case. <laughs> this diversity and our equality as citizens, I'm still quoting, within it is something our constitution celebrates and protects. In particular, a measure should not constitute an abuse of power or impose such a substantial or undue burden uh, or undue harm on those excluded from its benefits that our long-term constitutional goal of achieving real equality in diversity would be threatened, end of quote. One must therefore look at the impact that the remedial measures will have on the group or groups that might be negatively affected by the measures. The court would not invalidate its such me measures merely because it can be shown that the excluded group has been negatively affected in some way or another. Um, so, for example, the admissions policies of UCT which reserves certain places for black South Africans, say at the medical school, it can be arguably be argued that uh, it disadvantages those marginal white students who might have gotten into the medical school had they not been such a program. But that will not be sufficient. You have to show that it will cause undue harm. So um, you have to show that it sends a signal that the group uh, is not equally worthy of concern and respect with other groups. So, uh, at this point perhaps it's important to just note that the court also leaves the door open for a re-evaluation of this policy in the future. As a, uh, uh, what the court said was firstly that apart from race, there are other levels and forms of social differentiation and systemic underprivilege which still persist in our society, and the Constitution enjoin us to dismantle those also. Uh, sexism, homophobia, prejudice based on disability or HIV status, and other aspects of or characteristics of a person's personality which invoke opprobrium may also be targeted. While the Constitutional Court recognizes that at present, Section 9.2 must be interpreted with specific re reference to our apartheid past, and while it has, take, has to take into account the effects of past and continued unfair racial discrimination and racism, when it evaluates the constitutionality of corrective measures, it, is also, recog it also recognizes that this context in which they judge uh, and the actual situation of individual people and groups might change over time. If power in society shifts fundamentally, and if the dominance of of what I call whiteness as a norm subsides in our society, the court might well evaluate remedial measures differently from what it does at the moment. 